Well, good evening. My name is Joshua Knott. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone Church. Uh, we exist to put lives on a firm foundation through prayer, proclamation, praise, and recreation to the glory of God. Uh, it might not feel like recreation, but that is exactly what we're doing. The idea of recreation is that we take something that God has made and we cultivate it. We, we till it. So just like we work with our bodies tonight, we are working with our minds to grow. And we have a phenomenal speaker. And we are pleased to be host church to the Engaging the Culture series. And we hope it's a blessing to you. So we're glad that you're here. Uh, if you do not have a church home, if you're looking for one, uh, I could point to some godly, wonderful pastors and other churches that also believe the gospel and preach the word of God. But I happen to be really partial to this one. And so uh, if you're looking for a church home, please talk to me. I can point you in the right direction, but we'd love to have you here. Uh, there are restrooms right out those doors when you came in, so please take advantage of those anytime. And uh, if you have any, I don't see too many wiggle worms, but if you just have a sudden outburst of emotion or tears, we have a, a cry room in the back there. Just It's a one-way glass. So if you do need to take a break, please, it's a great place you can hear, and, uh, but you can still be a part of things. Uh, we are so glad you're here. Let me pray for us and then turn things over to Dr. Carper to introduce our guest speaker. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the minds that you have given to your people. And all of us have varying ability, but our common desire is we want to grow in understanding your world. We want to grow in understanding law. We want to grow in understanding our own nation, our own history, so that we might love our neighbors better so that we might talk to our neighbors and love even better. So God, we pray that you would uh, use this evening towards this end, that we might love our neighbor. So God, we thank you for our guest speaker. We thank you for the Carpers and their generosity, and we thank you for this evening. We lay it at your feet. Would you bless your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Well, let me add my welcome to uh, Joshua's, uh, welcome to the Engaging the Culture series, which since 2014 has hosted nationally recognized speakers who have addressed topics of common concern to Christian and non-Christian alike. Uh, this series has been largely underwritten to this point in time by the generosity of my late parents, Mary Jane and Chris Carper, whose pictures are down there on the altar, and the work of my brother John, uh, they all deserve a great deal of thanks. Uh, in order to remain free of charge, uh, you may wish to support our future events uh, by dropping a donation in the donation box there at the end of the center aisle. There is another donation box in the hallway which you will traverse on your way down to the reception after the Q&A. Uh, by the way, this program will be structured somewhat like this. Uh, Professor Witte will speak for about an hour, then we'll probably have a little stretch break. Uh, during that time you can write uh, questions on the back of the white card that you were given coming in. If you don't have one of those white cards, you can hold up your hand and one of our ushers will get that to you. Or on the back of the white card you'll find a number that you can text. We are high tech here. You can text your question uh, for Dr. Witte. Uh, let's see, what else? A um, couple of housekeeping uh, matters. You've been told about the cry room for squirmy and disgruntled people, and that's back there on the right. Uh, it's got good sound in it, so if you want to take a break from here, you can go there. No cell phones, please. Turn your sound off or your sound down. Put it on vibrate. Uh, let's see, what else? I think that's enough. I think we are all ready. Uh, by the way, after the Q&A session up here, we'll take another break, and uh, Professor Witte and his wife Eliza, who is with us down here on the front row, uh, will proceed down to the fellowship hall for some refreshment. We have set up a round table there where you can sit and face-to-face -face talk to one of the premier constitutional scholars in the United States. So don't miss that opportunity. Most of you probably received our publicity folder. You probably know quite a bit about Professor Witte already, but just let me reemphasize, 
Uh, John holds two shared professorships, one in law and one in religion at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. He's published hundreds of journal articles. He has authored or co-edited 40-some books. He has lectured literally all over the world. So what you have here tonight is a man who has lectured at Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Oxford, Berkeley, Yale, and now Cornerstone. <laughs> so yeah, we are in, we are in high, high corn country, let me tell you. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor John Whitty. John? Thank you so much. I think I just lost my uh, microphone here, pardon me. That's embarrassing. It'll get better from here, I think. So, Dr. Carper gave me an assignment. You have one hour to talk about the origins of the Supreme Court case law of and the future of religious freedom in the United States. No more than an hour, no shorter than 59 minutes. And so I have a tall task this evening, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking with you about uh, American religious freedom, uh, past, present, and future. And I want to start with the text, which is our meditation for the evening, which is a 16-word guarantee in the First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Um, that guarantee was crafted by the first Congress in 1789, ratified by the requisite uh, Ninth State in 1791, and continues to be the law of the land to this day. 243 U.S. Supreme Court cases have interpreted and applied uh, the First Amendment religious freedom norms, and thousands of lower federal case, court cases have echoed and elaborated uh, what uh, the court has given us. That's not the only religious freedom guarantee we have in this country. We use the free speech clause of the First Amendment to do a lot of religious freedom work. Uh, the First Amendment itself sits on top of uh, the Constitution, which has a no religious test clause in Article 5. Uh, we also have many state constitutions that antedate and postdate uh, the Constitution. 11 of 13 states from 1776 uh, to 1784 had detailed religious freedom provisions in place, and the constitutional drafters drew upon uh, those provisions in part as they thought through uh, the contents of the eventual First Amendment. Um, we have also many statutes at the federal, state, and local level that guard religious freedom. Uh, and increasingly, we have uh, bodies of state Supreme Court case law interpreting and applying those statutes and their own state constitutional provisions. So if you really want to stay for a few months uh, tonight, we could uh, get a start on what could be a three-month series of conversations. Uh, many of you will be in the crying room uh, pretty quickly uh, as we continue. Uh, but it'll get you a good sense of what's going on in the field. But I'd like to just use uh, six principles that the American founders in the 1776 to 1791 period had in place for thinking about religious freedom, tell you a little bit about what the founders understood by each of those principles, and then watch how the U.S. Supreme Court case law over time has applied each of those principles and then save a little room at the end uh, to talk a little bit about the future. So six principles help inform the founders' understanding of the religious freedom guarantees of the state constitutions and of the First Amendment. And the first one of them is liberty or freedom of conscience. Freedom of conscience is an ancient guarantee goes back to the Roman Stoics. It is uh, articulated uh, in the Bible in the early church fathers, and it's a fundamental understanding uh, of the core of religious freedom. 
Uh, it's used throughout history, uh, oftentimes as a plea for protection, uh, and it is one of the grounding and founding norms of religious freedom uh, in this country. The American founders, when they use the term, use it with three different distinct understandings in mind, and each of them has borne fruit in U.S. Supreme Court case law. The first thing about freedom of conscience is it's a guarantee of voluntarism. And what we mean by that is the American founders insisted that religion is something that is chosen, something that is shaped, something that can be reject rejected, something that can be altered, and it's not something that you receive from your mother or father through matrilineal or patrilineal descent. It is not something that comes to you uh, by reason of the caste or class in which you exist. Religion is something that you choose. These are very much Armenians' propositions. Free will gui guided the founders in part around this question, and their thought was we have to protect everybody's ability to choose and change and to reject their faith. We cannot force that on them. We cannot prescribe it for them. We have to let people articulate the faith that they ultimately voluntarily embrace. And that idea that you can choose, change, and reject faith is baked into the American experiment of religious freedom. It is part of early U.S. Supreme Court case law, which says very early from the 1860s forward, you have to allow people to leave their religious communities if they wish. They have to leave uh, freely, without encumbrance by the religious authorities of that community, without encumbrance from the state, and without reprisal uh, from the community or from the state as a consequence of their choice to leave. And they can leave monasteries, they can leave parishes, they can leave churches, they can leave communities. Uh, that is a fundamental axiom in American constitutional law, jealously guarded to this day, and we now apply it in addition with kidnapping and false imprisonment and other kinds of considerations, especially when it comes to sects or cults that hold people hostage. And we will penalize uh, Muslims or others that issue fatwas or other kind of reprisals uh, on people when they leave the faith. That's an axiomatic. Second kind of concern that the founders had in mind with freedom of conscience was freedom from coercion. We do not want the state to coerce people into participating in faith, articulating faith, being part of a faith community. We don't want to coerce religion. Religion has to be freely chosen, and the antonym of that is that we do not want the state forcing people into participating in religion if they don't wish to, and not participating in a religion that they don't want to in particular. And that, too, is a fundamental axiom that the tradition only comes to gradually. It was normal in the past to force people to participate in faith, whether they chose it or not chose it. It was normal to issue reprisals if they failed to do so. It was normal to condition benefits and other goodies upon their ability to be part of a faith community or participate in a faith activity. And the founders said, that's something we don't do. And that, in this country, uh, has been an important part of American constitutional case law as well. We don't force people to swear oaths. We don't force people uh, to make pledges of allegiance. We don't force people to participate in religious prayers or community activities that they don't want to. We don't force people to pay tithes in support of religious communities that they're not a voluntary member of. Um, and we don't force people to articulate speech that they cannot abide. And that's an issue that's already before the, before the Supreme Court recently, especially in dealing with uh, questions of uh, service to same-sex parties and same-sex weddings. The Supreme Court, the 2018 case, Masterpiece Cake Shop, uh, the case was in part a concern about being coerced into participating in a same-sex wedding by an artistic expression of bake, baking the cake. Uh, and the court, protected the right of a baker to forego that baking of a cake, even though he was engaged in a public accommodation. And there's a case before the court currently dealing with somebody who wants to create a website service for weddings, but does not want to uh, offer that website service to same-sex weddings, only to other sex weddings, on the argument that I cannot be forced to express myself in support of a form of marriage that I find odious. 
and the Supreme Court has that case before them, and I dare say the court, using this freedom of conscience understanding, is going to be jealous in the protection uh, of that website to sign in. And the third aspect of liberty of conscience that the founders held dear was that one of the things that we must respect is that parties sometimes are conscientiously opposed to abiding by the state's law, abiding by the policies that the state has in place, and the state's prescriptions or proscriptions force them to act contrary to their conscience, force them to do something or forgo something that they feel compelled in conscience to do. And very early on, one of the ways of cashing out that third consideration uh, was with the idea of exemptions, giving the conscientiously opposed exemptions from compliance with laws that everybody else had to abide. Early on, it was about pacifists and conscientious objection to military service. Uh, it was also about oath swearing uh, and people not being, allowed, not being able to swear an oath and being exempt from compliance with it. But over time, it became the concern about well, periodically, our way of worship or our set of activities require us to do something different from what the state does. And so if the state wants to mandate uh, being in activity on Sunday or Saturday, uh, and my understanding of the Sabbath requires me to be off that day, I need an exemption from compliance with that law. If that state has a certain dress code that mandates a certain way of dressing, but my faith requires me to wear a crucifix or wear a yarmulke or wear other religious paraphernalia, contrary to that dress code in a school or even in the military, I want an exemption from compliance uh, with that general law. And there are dozens of these kind of concerns about exemption that the Supreme Court has ebbed and flowed over time and accommodating, but in the current court is very jealously protecting uh, for individuals as well as for groups. And the most dramatic recent example of that is the Hobby Lobby case, where the uh, Affordable Care mandate um, indicated that parties who were private employers would have to carry health insurance uh, that provided insurance for their employees, including insurance covering uh, 20 different forms of um, contraception, including four abortifacients. And here is a private employer, Hobby Lobby, that says, we could live, I guess, with paying for insurance. I guess we could live with paying for insurance that covers non-abortifacient contraceptives, but we simply cannot carry insurance that will cover those four abortifacients. And they sought an exemption from compliance with the full, full operation of the ACA mandate against them and the Supreme Court in the Hobby Lobby case gave them that accommodation. Exemptions are part of the way, part of the equitable easing, the kind of oil that helps allow for uh, people of faith sometimes to live in nonconformity. Second principle of the founding era that is critically important, set out in every state constitution uh, and in the First Amendment as well, is a free exercise guarantee. A guarantee not only that you can have your faith, but you can manifest that faith in a variety of ways. You can gather for worship, you can speak, you can publish, you can parent, you can proselytize, uh, you can participate in good works in the community. Um, exercising your faith and putting into operation what you believe is thought to be an essential, an essential one-two um, understanding of what religious freedom is about. James Madison, one of the great founders, says religion is the duty that we owe to our creator and the manner of discharging it. Belief and action are side-by-side -side guarantees uh, of religious freedom in the day. And free exercise rights are a critical part of the early experiment, and it's the freedom to exercise, to put into practice uh, one's faith as an individual, and the founders understood at the same time this was not just an individual guarantee. Free exercise rights are to be enjoyed, yes, by individuals, but they're also to be enjoyed by groups qua groups. And that seems unremarkable to us today to think that a group has a right, but in the late 18th century, 
the idea that a corporation had a right as with a set of fundamental goods attached to it, that it was a fictitious person that could operate as if a person and could enjoy a set of rights, that was unusual in the 18th century and in 125 countries around the world today. The very idea of having religious group rights is the most contested issue that many minority faiths have to negotiate, sometimes with difficulty and oftentimes unsuccessfully, to have an identity as a group. But the founders early on said, we want to make sure that religious communities, qua communities, have the right to exist, to hold property, to have buildings, to have employees, to have standards of entrance and exit, to have the ability to perpetuate themselves, to have relationships with co-religionists uh, in other states and sometimes in other countries, to be able to operate independent of the individuals that make it up. The this, this church qua church, the religious community qua religious community, has the right to exercise itself. And Thomas Jefferson, of all people, says very clearly, it is the body of Christ on earth. And that body, in order to survive, has to have exercise. And that idea is very much part of the understanding of the founders back then, and it continues. Free exercise rights of individuals and free exercise of groups to this day are a fundamental part of the operation of the First Amendment. Uh, Two-thirds of the U.S. Supreme Court case law is on free exercise rights, and it's the free exercise rights of Jehovah's Witnesses to proselytize, uh, to hold uh, services in public parks in order to gain access to limited forums. It's the right of Seventh-day Adventists to exercise their faith, even on Saturday, and sometimes with exemptions. Uh, it's the rights uh, of religious communities to come together and to organize themselves and to have the ability to hire pastors and other religious leaders that share their faith, even though civil rights acts would say something to the contrary, to have the autonomy to make those choices for themselves. Uh, it's the rights uh, of various faith communities, uh, to especially to have relationships with co-religionists abroad. Uh, that's a fundamental hard question, especially with international relations being contested. It's the right of these religious groups to make their own decisions about intra-church disputes over property. The Presbyterian Church gave us a number of cases before the court dealing with that, and the court repeatedly said, you guys figure it out for yourselves. You have the corporate free exercise rights to decide your own property divisions and disputes, and we'll back you up. Those are fundamentals baked into the First Amendment. Third important and distinctive provision in the 18th century that's part of the American constitutional experiment in religious freedom is that religious pluralism, a multitude of religions, is a good rather than a bad. Now that's unusual in the 18th century. The historical position from the 4th century, the late 4th century, with the establishment of Orthodox Trinitarian Christianity in 381 by the Roman Empire, which said that there is one Orthodox Trinitarian Christian faith to be maintained here, and all others are mad and raving fools. That idea, set out in 380, is an enduring 1,400-year mandate for the Western legal tradition. One faith, one territory, one baptism, one people, with the only question being whether we're going to tolerate anyone else because we need them. Somebody's got to pay the taxes, somebody's got to break the field, somebody's got to be sent to the front lines, and so we always have a grudging toleration, but there's always this dialectic between the utility of having a few different kind of people and the purest narrative that says we only want to have one, and when the purists are in charge, all the dissenters get kicked out. And the founders came to that traditional position and said, we're going to flip the paradigm. And the paradigm for us is that all faiths are welcome. A multitude of religious communities can exist, coexist in a community, and there will be not one that's favored over the rest. The idea is to say that a whole multiplicity of sects is better than a single sect. Why? 
Well, part of the argument is theological. And it's in part Presbyterian. It is the idea that, look, um, we think it better to allow a multitude of forms of faith to flourish and leave it to God in God's absolute sovereignty. Leave it to God to decide which of these forms of religion should flourish and which of them should fail. God has it within God's providence to make these decisions. God can decide which of these forms of faith need to be blessed and which of them need to variously fade away. And that's not anybody's prerogative here on earth. It's certainly not the prerogative of the state. And the idea is very much a theological idea, that a multitude of religions is good. And some would add the stories of the post-resurrection experience. And they would say, look, the whole point of those stories of the 40 days after Christ was risen from the grave, uh, the whole point of those is to show all the different ways by which you can experience and express Christ. Right? Mary needs to be called by name before she recognizes Christ. Before that, she thought he was a gardener. The two men from Emmaus have to have, they can talk all day long about salvation history with Jesus, but the only way they recognize him is when he holds up the host and blesses it in the Eucharist. The men gathered in the disciples, huddled in the room, huddled in the room in fear of reprisal by the Roman authorities, they recognize Christ only when he comes in and breathes his spirit on them. Thomas, the great, the great doubter, recognizes Christ only when he has the opportunity to put his finger, the tactile experience with Christ. And Peter, Simon Peter. Simon Peter recognizes Christ only after he has a miracle of catching a multitude of fish and sitting in a threefold cross-examination. Simon Barjona, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? The point of those stories, the founders, the far-seated theological, far-thinking, theologically inclined founders would say, the point of those stories is to say all the different ways we experience Christ after the resurrection, after Easter. Each of them is legitimate. Some called by name, some focused on that event, some focused on the Eucharist, some focused on the spirits, some focused on um, various kinds of direct encounters, curiosities, some focused on a very deep dialogical encounter. Uh, all of those are legitimate ways to think about experiencing Christ, and each one of those gathers churches around it, and each of them has to be respected. That's one. It's a theological proposition for pluralism. And there's a flip side, which is the utilitarian argument. This is a good way of checking and balancing excess. And Madison's Federalist Paper, number 10 and 51, where Madison, looking over at the cacophony of different political interests in the country, said, this is good rather than bad. Diversity, multitudes of factions are good rather than bad because they check and balance each other. They keep any one of these one views from dominating without proper inspection and introspection uh, from others. And same thing, he says, by analogy, is true in religious communities. Let a multitude of, flower, multitude of religions coexist and let them check and balance each other and make sure that each of them has proved rigorous to its own particular confessional stand. It's a kind of early religious Darwinism, a kind of survival of the faithful, a survival of the fittest uh, in faith. Uh, and that idea, too, sponsors pluralism. That is part of the American story from the start. A multitude of religions are welcome here. Already in the colonial period, certainly in the 19th century, all the outcasts of Western Europe dump their folks over here, and multitudes of folks start coming from around the world to practice their faith here. And the First Amendment, early on, is all about protection of these minorities, giving these folks certain kinds of protections that the state legislatures aren't giving them making sure that those rowdy Jehovah's Witnesses get their day in court. Make sure these peculiar Seventh-day Adventists get their early protection. Make sure even an atheist in Tricasso v. Watkins is given the opportunity to disavow his participation in a religious test oath. And one of the stories of the American experiment is its ever greater inclusivity in who gets to show up at court. Few people, few people get bounced out 
uh, at the standing phase of walking into a federal court. Everybody gets their day in court, even if they may lose. And today, all the edgy faith, all these Sumamites are showing up, and now the Muslims are showing up, and a variety of kind of new kinds of personality cults are showing up in court, and they're getting their day in court. Pluralism being respected, and at the same time, the structural pluralism that the founders talked about is also being respected. What do I mean by that? It's not just confessional pluralism, a multitude of sects, but also a recognition in the 18th century that religion is not just the stuff that goes on in prayer closets, not just the stuff that goes on in sanctuaries. It's multi-institutional. And pluralism now comes in the form of what religious charities and religious publishing houses and religious schools and religious organizations that do a number of distinctive things in the community. Um, religion lives in a multitude of brigades, uh, as Benjamin Rust puts it in the 18th century period, and each of those brigades needs to have its own religious freedom protection tool. And that also is baked into the American case law story, because very early on, um, we recognize all the different kinds of ways by, by which religious charities and monasteries and publishing houses and missionary organizations and service organizations get free exercise protection. We work hard in the American story, and we continue to work hard to this day to ensure that when faith informs a community, less about the label on the door and more about the functionality of what goes on in that community, that community can enjoy corporate free exercise rights, and that community is recognized as a form of faith. And we do that sometimes through provisions like the 501c3 status of organizations being tax exempt. We do that with religious and charitable corporation laws of two options people can pursue. But there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of faith recognized across this country and organized as faith communities. And there are hundreds of different variations on the non-worship context in which those faith communities claim a religious status and exercise um, religious freedom. Next principle that the founders spent time on, we've done liberty of conscience, free exercise for individuals and groups, pluralism both confessional and structural. Uh, the fourth principle that the founders spent some time talking about a lot is equality. You can have, sure, you can talk about every faith being welcome, you can talk about it being voluntary, you can talk about everybody having corporate free exercise rights, you can talk about pluralism, but if you don't, work on the presumption that faith communities have to be treated presumptively equal at law, then much of that is simply idle camp, idle chatter. And the guarantee of no discrimination against religion because it's religion, or no discrimination against one form of religion because we don't like them, is baked into the founding documents as well. And the thought is, is that presumptively all peaceable faiths are equal before the law. And we want that the law to recognize that they have equal access to religious and corporation status. They have equal access to tax exemption for their property. They have equal access to zoning opportunities uh, in the community. They have equal access to benefits that are made generally available to like position secular parties. The equality principle is an incredibly important one that the founders put in place. This, too, is a rebuke of a traditional caste system, a traditional hierarchy that said there is the established faith, and they are the most equal. It's George Orwell's Animal Farm that all are equal, but some are more equal than others. That idea of establishment, we don't like that in the American story. The thought is, is that everybody presumptively is equal not just the favored, not just the established, not just the preferred, not just the popular, not just those that have all the money. The presumption is the tiny, tiny peasant worshiping in his hovel with a few little co-religionists and the prince in his palace worshiping with the high and the mighty are equal before the law when it comes to religious freedom. And that equality principle uh, 
has become an important part of American jurisprudence in the last uh, several decades and has become a powerful part of the story in the most recent U.S. Supreme Court case law. Um, for a while in the 60s and 70s, especially when we had a zealous application of an Establishment Clause norm, I'll talk to you about in a little bit, where all of a sudden religious communities were excluded from all kinds of benefits. Religious student groups couldn't get access to public school facilities. You couldn't participate in religious, you as a religious person couldn't participate in a lot of benefits. And the thought over time was that's what establishment and no se separation of church and state demand. And eventually that began to view, be viewed as a real violation of the presumptive equality norm. And so for the 1980s to this day, the Supreme Court has increasingly said it's a matter of free speech rights, sometimes statutory rights, and now in the last five years, free exercise rights under the First Amendment, religious and non-religious folk have to be treated equally. Um, if you're going to open a forum in your university or your public high school for students to use, um, religious students have to have equal access just like their secular counterparts. If you're going to open your gymnasium in the evening for civic events, um, the local church that wants to use that for a film has to be given equal access to the local folks that want to show the sound of music. If you're going to have a benefit program, a scholarship say, for people that are precocious, meritorious, uh, and want to go to a university, you can't give that scholarship only to the secular students. You have to give it to the religious students alike. And you can't just give it to the secular schools. You have to give it to the religious schools alike. And equal access. If you're going to have a student activity fund at your university that's going to reimburse students for mm, their printing costs, for their brochures and other things they hand out, um, you're going to have to give equal access to the secular groups that are promoting Karl Marx uh, and the tree huggers and the tree slayers and the ROTC and the world's the women's club, but you're going to have to let the Christian club in too. And you're going to have to reimburse them for their paper as well. You've got to give equal access. And those are all free speech precedents the court articulates from the 80s to the early 2000s. And then in the last five years of Supreme Court case law, um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly said you have to give aid to religious and non-religious schools equally. That's a bugbear issue because state constitutions in the 19th century, 35 out of the 48 before 1948 said, hey, no state aid to religion. We can't give our money to religion. Those were transparently anti-Catholic measures. They were designed to keep the state from having to fund Catholic parochial schools. And those old state constitutional norms had for a long time been in the business of blocking direct state aid to religious schools. And in the last five years, the Supreme Court has said, nope, uh, you can't do that either. Here's a case, Trinity Lutheran in Missouri. They're trying to create a rubber asphalt program uh, so that little kids on playgrounds don't have to have their little knees harmed when they fall off the jungle gym or fall off the swing. And what does Missouri do? We've got all these tires around. Let's crunch them up and we'll give people rubber asphalt to put on their school playgrounds. Great! Anybody can apply. Just and we're going to base our application on how many students use your jungle gym, how open it is to the public, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a Lutheran school, the Trinity Lutheran School. They apply. They're fifth out of 44 on a list of people eligible based on the criteria set by the state. They have Lutheran children with bad knees that keep on falling off the jungle gym. And Missouri says, sorry, we can't give you rubber asphalt for your playground. Why? because you're Lutheran, because you're religious. And 20 years ago, that would have been an easy win uh, for Missouri. And now the Supreme Court, in a case in 2017, says to Trinity Lutheran, sorry, you're going to have to give rubber asphalt to the Lutheran kids too. You're not funding a school, you're funding asphalt. And the knees of the Lutherans and the knees of everyone else are the same when they're that small. <laughs> it's a kind of tongue-in-cheek case. But it introduces this principle of equality. And then the next case, here comes a tuition scholarship program where a private foundation collects 
contributions that are tax deductible from citizens and estates, and they deposit them into scholarship packages for students that go to a private school of their choice. And the program initially is for private secular school or private religious school. And here comes Montana and says, no, no, no. You can't give money to private religious schools because that, then we would be subsidizing through our tax deduction scheme uh, religious schools. And the Supreme Court again says, no, no, no. You're going to have this program, religious and non-religious, private schools have to be treated the same. And then the most recent case, Parsons v. Macon, is about students that are in rural districts in Maine, way away from any kind of population center that would allow to have a public school. And Maine historically has always said uh, to parents, here's a voucher. You send your kid to where you, you want the kid to go. And you can go to a public school nearby. You can go to a private school. You can go to a private religious school as long as it's not too sectarian based upon its mission, its makeup, its ministry, and other things. If it's too sectarian, we're not paying for it. And parents object. And they say, we want to go to a private sectarian school on your definition. And the Maine says, so sorry, you can't. And they bring a case before the Supreme Court. And last year, the Supreme Court said, equality. If you're going to have this kind of program, you can't discriminate against schools just because they're religious. Equality means equation. Fifth principle, um, separation of church and state. That's an old, old Western constitutional principle. It goes back to the Bible again. We've got all kinds of discussions in the Bible about walls and separation and the walls separating out the holy of holies from the commons and separating out the Jewish people from the outside world. Um, St. Paul in Ephesians 2.14 actually uses the word wall of separation. Wall of partition is how the RSV translates it, but it's wall of separation, paris Macadia. Uh, and it's that phrase that gets, gets picked up in tradition to do all kinds of interesting things, sometimes pernicious things too, uh, but it's largely uh, an invitation to a whole series of dualisms that emerge over time. Two ways, as the early church fathers talk about it, two cities, as Augustine talks about it, two powers, as Galatius talks about it, two swords that the Middle Ages articulate, two kingdoms as the Protestant reformers, two institutions of church and state. And the founders know all that history. They read it rather well, especially people like John Adams. Uh, they know that story. And for them, separation of church and state gets lifted up and placed into constitutional text for a couple of distinctive reasons which are quite different from what the Supreme Court makes them out to be. The founders thought about separation of church and state, first of all, to protect the state from the church. What's the worry? We do not want to have the Pope whispering in the prince's ear. We do not want to have one local pastor dictating to the mayor how he or she should run the show. We do not want to have a dominant religious community using their soul craft to direct statecraft. We want to keep religious communities from being distracted from their own ministry, but we also want to make sure that the statecraft that goes on is a product of multiple democratic voices, not the monopoly of a particular religious voice. And so separation of church and state is designed to kind of keep the core competence of the state away from the machinations of enterprising clergy, which for centuries had had free reign in dictating statecraft. And the thought now is that, okay, let's make sure that ministers don't serve in political office. Let's make sure that when they participate in, say, jury trials or things like that, that they have a muted voice. Let's make sure that they don't uh, actively uh, get in the business of the government itself. They can share, they can cooperate, they can help, they can, they can engage, especially in times of, major, of, of force majeure uh, in emergencies. They can do relief, they can do education, they can do charity, they can participate. This is not the state claiming a monopoly in the 18th century, it's rather a recognition that there's some core competence there that the state has that we do not want, the, the, especially things like taxes and military, that we don't want to have the religious folk involved in. And conversely, also, separation of church and state is designed to protect the church from the state. 
and to allow the churches to have their own autonomy, that corporate free exercise right shell that we're trying to create, and to ensure that that is not just a right that can be claimed by the church in a corporate free exercise context, but also a constraint imposed upon the government in its action with the church. You can't be in the business of collecting tithes for the church. You can't be in the business of dictating their doctrine, telling them about their liturgy, doing what historically was always done, including on the eve of the American Revolution, which was prescribing the faith. In the prescribed parliament issued 39 articles of the faith, or prescribing the right Bible, the authorized version, the King James Version of 1611, which state law in England and in the colonies dictated. Um, dictating the liturgical books to be used, like the Book of Common Prayer, which in 1662 was the liturgical standard book that to be used in the colonies. We don't want the state doing that. That's our stuff. And we don't want the state appealing, uh, listening to appeals from those internal decisions made by our religious community when we exercise our faith claim vis-a-vis -vis our voluntary members. They have the right to leave, because they have conscience right, and they can leave unencumbered from our community but when they're in our community, we don't want you now second-guessing our decisions about uh, where they are in their faith journey and how we have treated or not treated them. This is not a license for the ecclesiastical veil to provide a cover for a crime. You can't abuse your children. You cannot embezzle funds. You cannot engage in uh, simple torts against your neighbor. Uh, that you do it with a collar or without a collar, uh, with a pastoral or without a pastoral office doesn't change the fact that what you're doing is crime and tort. But notwithstanding that, there's a presumption, there's a presumption that the peaceable legal activities within the religious community are not interfered with or appealed to the state. Um, separation of church and state was classically about that. It became, in the hands of the U.S. Supreme Court after the 1940s, um, a license for a couple of things. One, uh, it became a license for an increasing insistence on the secularization of law. And the Supreme Court in the 1940s and 50s, and then ensconced in the case Lemon v. Kurtzman in 1971, says every law, in order to satisfy uh, the Establishment Clause, to satisfy the basic principle of separation of church and state in the Establishment Clause, Every law must have a secular purpose, a primary effect that neither advance nor inhibit religion, and number three, foster no excessive entanglement between church and state. A kind of prescribed secularism, and an, arg and an argument that says, look, we want to have non-religious reasons for the articulation of law. And you're gonna have to translate your religious stuff into secular language, or it can't pass muster. And increasingly, we want you to shroud your religious identity and argumentation so that a law can be viewed as neutral or secular vis-a-vis -vis everyone else. And that idea gets baked into U.S. constitutional law from the 1960s to the 1990s. It is, emerges out of a very strong kind of new liberal, neoliberal posture, including from my old professor John Rawls, his book of great book on theory of justice, comes out in 1971, the same year that Levin v. Kurtzman comes out. This is very much the anti-authoritarian, hippie days, the God is dead movement, uh, even in seminaries. There's a very, very strong kind of post-religiosity cast that goes on in the culture, and that trickles into the Supreme Court case law as well. And separation of church and state becomes the banner which is waved for that view. And laws increasingly, and public activity and public and political deliberation have to be increasingly atheological, bracketed religion, bracket religion from the conversation. And that idea was powerful in the 90s and increasingly today is falling aside. Part of it is postmodernism. Everybody's articulating whatever they want to have, and religion folks are just being articulate about their views too. Everybody's exhibiting whatever symbolism and music and identity uh, markers that they want to have, and religion is doing it too. And religion is not foreclosed anymore in a way that 30 years ago, religion was foreclosed. We could have an embryo religion and law program, which was inconceivable 40 years ago. 
uh, and there are dozens of them around the world now. There's a thought now that suddenly religion, overt religion, not camouflage religion, not First Amendmentized religion, not shrouded religion, not kind of bleached and bland religion, religion now can come back. But separation of church and state, version number one, is about secularization and forced secularization by the Supreme Court. And that, from the 60s to the 90s, was the rate, was the norm, and increasingly today is no longer the norm. Second aspect of separation of church and state is um, assuring religious communities the autonomy to do things themselves. And that be has become an increasingly powerful norm. It's part of corporate free exercise rights, but it's also part of the constitutional concerns of separation of church and state, to make sure that religious communities may have the autonomy to govern their own affairs, to hire the pastors and rabbis and imams they want to hire, to be able to maintain their own standards of entrance and exit, to have their own ministries and activity in the community. With or without the support of the state, that's a separate matter, but very much uh, giving them the space to be religious in their own space. Um, and yes, that historically is what the founders were about. The founders articulated it back then, uh, but it was oftentimes honored in the breach, especially for the unpopular, especially for the outsider, um, especially for Catholics for a while, especially for Jews for a while, especially for Eastern Orthodox for a while. And now increasingly today, um, the separation of church and state principle really is very much a assurance that the state will give labor, employment, interest, religious disputes um, a great deal of deference and a great deal of room to be worked out for themselves. Um, I've got five minutes left and I have to do the future. Um, so <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about establishment of religion. You got, um, you got 10, John. You got 10. I got 10, okay. <laughs> um, so where are we? Um, if you asked me that question 20 years ago, I would say religious freedom is in trouble in this country. Religious freedom is in trouble in part because the Supreme Court has turned off, has turned down and sometimes even turned off the religious freedom norms. And for a while in the late 90s and early 2000s, the Supreme Court was getting out of the religious freedom business, the federal courts were getting out of the religious freedom business, and increasingly religion and religious freedom were being viewed as second-class rights. And when there was a conflict between other rights, rights, say, of same-sex marriage, rights, say, of sexual liberty, rights of any other sort, uh, almost always in those contexts, um, religious freedom uh, came in second. Uh, and sometimes these were staged cases, sometimes these were people that were really sticking their chins out and trying to create precedents. Uh, but there was a real concern 20 years ago that religious freedom um, had had its day. And the elites and the media, the elites in the academy, uh, were pushing that agenda. Well, why? Um, part of it was we just had 9-11, and we worried about mm, militant religion. We just had the massive pedophilia scandal exposed in the Catholic Church and then also began to be evident in Protestant churches uh, as well. We had all manner of investigations being made of these remarkable mega churches that were sitting on massive tax exempt property and their Bentley driving, Jaguar driving pastors uh, living a wonderfully luxurious lifestyle, uh, all with tax exempt property and tax exempt income. Um, and we had strong political gamesmanship uh, by some religious communities uh, that began to hitch their wagons uh, to particular political causes that became unpopular. And the most obvious were when religious communities began to challenge the rise of sexual liberty and same-sex liberty, began to challenge um, traditional or older um, constitutional privacy claims of contraception and abortion, uh, and the culture wars that that precipitated were very serious. Um, this came at exactly a time when the US Supreme Court 
was very much in the business of an affirmative action program for same-sex partners. Constitutions, James, uh, John Adams used to say, constitutions work like clocks. And in order for them to work properly, their pendulums have to swing back and forth, and occasionally their operations have to get wound up. And boy, for a while, we had a big wind-up and a big pendular swing, uh, with the Supreme Court leading the cause for same-sex liberty. And case, back early case, Romer, and then Lawrence, and then Windsor, and then Obergefell, and then Bostock, the Supreme Court for 25 years is basically saying the pendulum is swinging in favor of same-sex liberty and everybody get out of the way. And what was one consequence of that pendular swing, given the culture war context, was that religion suddenly had to duck rather than simply stand firm. And on that one, um, we had a really serious collision for a while, and Christian and other faith communities really lost. That pendulum swing for same-sex liberty is beginning to recede. It's had its day. And what's interesting is this U.S. Supreme Court in the last 10 years is now on a new affirmative action program, and it's in favor of religion and religious freedom. It is very much in the mode of pushing cases. 20, 21 cases since 2012, where the Supreme Court has held time and time again that religious freedom norms need to be vindicated. And a court that's pushing very strongly against some of those precedents, especially the strict separation of church and state precedents of the last third of the 20th century, reversing a few of them and pushing hard against their basic uh, articulation. That old lemon test that prescribes secularism, which is still the formal test on the books of the Supreme Court, as increasingly saying we're abandoning that. We're not going to use the Establishment Clause as a battering ram to allow secularists to engage in heckler's vetoes of popular stuff. The court is increasingly in a mode of federalism as well, where the court is saying rather than having some universal law about religious freedom or non-religious freedom, we're going to allow for more diversity. The very pluralism that the founders talked about, these guys are talking about too, and it's okay. It's okay to have pockets of religious identity and practice in local communities that get more respect than 30 years ago they got under the Establishment or Free Exercise Clause. So I think the one thing that's quite clear, and I think the one thing that will continue with this current court, is a pretty strong surge in favor of religious freedom. Eras come and go, but we are in a new era of strong religious freedom. Uh, it's 10 years old, it's 21 cases deep, uh, and for the next 10 or 12 years, I suspect that trend will continue. It may go too far, at which point the court will retreat, there may be new justices on the bench, and that may change things. But for a time now, uh, there is, I think, more protection. There's also, secondly, um, still some very deep, glaring uh, concerns in the religious freedom area. Um, Native American Indian claims have always, have always gotten hammered before the U.S. Supreme Court and below the end before federal courts. And indigenous rights claims on commu in communities that have an independent status of constitutional law and for whom we have special statutory protections in the American Indian Religious Freedom Act of 1978, they almost always lose before the federal courts. Uh, and that in many ways is a shame. Um, it's both a violation of the basic equality and non-discrimination norms that we hold dear. Um, in many ways, the treatment of Native American Indians is one of the original sins of the American story and needs to be redressed. And the increasing obtuseness on the part of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, and lower federal courts with respect to Native American Indians is a blight on our record. Mahatma Gandhi once said, a nation's dedication to religious freedom is how well it treats its most hated minority. And on that scale, um, we don't do well. And that speaks to the third question, which is, what do we do with Islam? Five million plus in the country, growing rapidly. 
Um, 18 states now have anti-Sharia measures on the books. There's a very, very strong kind of singling out of this particular faith community, the way we used to do with Catholics, the way we used to do with Jews, and now we're doing exactly the same playbook uh, with Muslims. Um, it doesn't take a bleeding heart. It simply takes an operation of the golden rule to appreciate the other and to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And one of the dangers of this kind of exclusivism that we see in some of the religious freedom rhetoric of the culture and the religious freedom rhetoric of the Supreme Court case law is that they're increasingly saying it's religious freedom for us and not religious freedom for them. And 50 years from now, 50 years from now, when your grandkids are sitting in the seat, they're going to be minorities as Christians. And they're going to be subject to the rules that we are making now. And one of the real dangerous aspects of this new surge of religious freedom is it's religious freedom for some and not religious freedom for all. And that not only violates the spirit of the original Constitution, which was religious freedom for all and religious establishment for none, but it also violates the fundamental, the fundamental teachings of Jesus, which were to go out and meet with a Samaritan woman, go with the downs and outs of society, dine with the tax collectors and the prostitutes, spend time with the outsiders of our society. And for those of us that are holding out religious freedom, um, one of the things that's important for us to do uh, is to work hard on the frontier for those that are not protected. There are charlatans. There are people who abuse religious freedom. There are people who are not peaceable. There are people that violate basic democratic values and who don't start with the constitutional premise of a rule of law and a constitutional democracy dedicated to freedom for all. Those people are different from the ones I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are the poor folk um, that simply want to live a life of quiet faith and are being ignored. And those are the folks, I think, that we would do well to seek out. I've probably said enough. People are going to the crying room now, Jim, so I think we better stop talking. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. You have a white card in your hand, I think. If not, someone will get one for you. If you have questions for John about anything he said or did not say, um, write them down, and we'll ask John to address those uh, here in the next half hour or so. Uh, or you can text. There's a number uh, you can see up there at the top. I'm sorry, it's on the reverse. And you can text your questions, and we will, uh, we will address those accordingly. After about a half hour of that kind of interchange, uh, we'll adjourn. Some of you maybe need to leave or go to the cry room or whatever. And uh, John and Eliza will be downstairs in the uh, fellowship hall. And you can sit down and talk face to face uh, with John and uh, pose any question that you, you might have. So let's take uh, three or four minutes here, stand up, stretch your legs, write your questions, text your questions, and then we'll put him on the spot. you account for the rather quick reversal between Minersville and Barnett? I mean, that's three years. Yeah. What, what happened? I mean, the court did change some, I assume. Two other justices. Um, World Frank, War II. Frank Frank change was made too, yeah. Court. Yeah. I think he realized that it was his friends across the hall. Yeah. Yeah. The World War II did some things.
pass some of these to me here? Do you want? Do you want? Do you want to take? Do you want to take the print and I'll take the the text? Yes. Got a lot of them coming in. The foundation uh, of gifts uh, are yeah, if you yeah, if, if you write a check to Cornerstone and just put ES ECS on it, yeah, it's tax deductible. Yeah, yeah, cash, no, that's, that's that's well, you can take it as a cash contribution on your 1040. If you want to deduct your pay check. Yeah, you could probably do that. You could. Okay. We got a bunch. All right, if we could. Oh. That, you can walk around anywhere you want to, John. You're one of those classroom walkers. I know the, I know the type. I am one. So these are your parents? Yes. They've been, they've been gone for uh, 10 years and 20 years. Good folks. He was a flyer. He was a, yeah, TLUA for 35 years. Military before that. Military before that. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd uh, take a seat. Well, I'm, st I'm still trying to. Why don't you start off? I'm going to translate a couple of these. We have a number of questions that have been addressed, and uh, Joshua and I are going to try to coalesce some of them into three questions in one. It's very Trinitarian. And uh, John says he likes to wander. So stay awake. He might wander toward you. <laughs> okay. All right, so... Uh, John, uh, first question, how do you see the rise of religious nationalism across the world, also in our own land, affecting the commitment within U.S. law and jurisprudence to protect religious pluralism? So could you weigh in on the, the rising tide of religious nationalism and what its effect might be? Yeah, so it's a, um, a worrisome trend for those that watch uh, democracies around the world and also on democracies. Uh, what we see now around the world is 198 different territories and independent polities, and 110 of them uh, have forms of religious persecution and have receded in their recognition of different forms of faith rather than increased, which had been the trend in the prior 50 years. Uh, and a good bit of the... Um, cause for that is the increasingly belligerent forms of religious nationalism and also ethnic and uh, sometimes linguistic identity that gets attached uh, to uh, a particular community. We're going back to the 19th century, uh, even the pre-18th century, uh, where every religious community, uh, every, every country has its own favorite religious community. And we're Russian Orthodox here in Russia, thank you. We're Catholic here in Italy, thank you. We are Reformed Protestants here in Swiss, we're serious Presbyterians in Scotland, and everybody else, please leave. Uh, and if not, we're gonna make life uncomfortable for you, if not officially make it difficult for you uh, to continue to exist. And increasingly castigate you as second class citizens, foreclose you from a variety of benefits, make it hard for you to uh, have property licenses, make it hard for you to probate wills, 
make it difficult for you to get a proper jury in front of you. Um, those old rules of discrimination and abuse of minorities, ethnic, linguistic, and religious, are coming back. And they're coming back with a vengeance in many parts of the world. Uh, and notwithstanding our increasingly um, robust religious freedom and other traditions, um, we're finding uh, the law in the books and the law in, the, in action increasingly discordant. I think in this country, uh, religious nationalism has uh, resulted in some aspects of xenophobia, uh, some aspects of anti-Islam sentiment, uh, some increasing incidents of anti-Semitism, uh, increasing uh, concern about nativism versus uh, outsiders and immigrants. Um, and it's not just the uh, kind of fringe uh, um, radical policy. It's always been throughout our history part of our story but increasingly front page stuff. And it's that which is a little bit worrisome. Um, the prior administration, I think, fed the flames a little bit with some fairly strident um, anti-immigrant postures uh, that really began to encourage uh, further views of that sort. But it wasn't simply a uh, feature of one administration. I think it's been a growing trend. Uh, and we stand with the world uh, in terms of the increase of that. And it's not good for religious freedom. It's not good for uh, non-discrimination norms more generally, uh, and it's not an American way to go. Uh, one of the whole stories of the 19th and 20th century was open arms, uh, and closed borders and open arms are hard to hold together. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned previously how the story of our nation and also Presbyterianism have intertwined and mm -hmm. had many different touch points. Uh, someone asked, could you tell us a little about John Witherspoon and the American changes made to the original Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 23, on civil magistrates? Yeah. Um, in my car, I got a box of books to, uh, on John Witherspoon, which I've got to read because I've got to write a chapter on him in a book called The Reformation of Rights II, which I'm looking at the 18th to 21st century story of right thought in the Calvinist tradition, building on a book already existing. Amazon.com has one called The Reformation of Rights. Um, I think it's very clear that Scottish Presbyterianism and Scottish common sense philosophy more generally had a disproportionately strong impact uh, on the American founding period, even though it was a relatively small population of folks that uh, came from Scotland in the 18th century and that were part of the story. Part of that is because of John Witherspoon's outsized influence. The first president of Log College, now Princeton, uh, teacher of James Madison who had a massive impact uh, teacher of, I think, 33 other uh, participants in the Constitutional Convention and or the first state Constitutional Convention or ratification debates and um, an influence at least 50 or 55 others who became representatives of senators in their states. So he had an outsized influence in part because he was at Princeton, in part because he was a dynamic speaker, in part he was a great preacher, and in part because he had a capacity to bring the subtleties of Presbyterian theology to bear uh, on uh, a variety of different questions of politics. Um, one of the hard questions that the American founders have to fuss with in the 18th century is what do we do about establishments, established forms of faith, uh, where the state is in the business of defining, fixing, um, requiring by law <coughs> certain kinds of doctrines, certain kinds of liturgies, certain kinds of texts, certain kinds of practices, collect tithes on behalf of the established church, uh, administer oaths that compri comprise, um, co are consistent with the uh, oath form uh, in a particular community, uh, and do a number of other things to um, favor a form of faith. So we get some of that from 18th century Scotland. Uh, Witherspoon has to, and others, have to negotiate, well, how does Presbyterianism work in the colonies and then in the new nation? And one of the changes that gets to be made in the Westminster Confession uh, and in a number of other documents in the day is to try to nuance the question of should the kirk be established or at least favored uh, or should it just be given freedom like other forms of faith and Witherspoon was among those that uh, helped uh, engineer uh, gradual shifts in some of the post European based confessional documents like the catechism and confessions in Westminster uh, and adjust them to the American story. Takes a while 
it's very controversial. The Dutch Reform faith, which, uh, which Father Joshua and I, or Reverend Joshua and I know uh, a lot about, um, the Dutch Reform faith fought about this and all confessions as well. Uh, it's an it's a ongoing negotiation and it was even worse for the Anglicans because they threw out the king who was the supreme head of the church, uh, the defender of the faith, and what do we do now with this new world uh, that has just cut off its head? Uh, and so they formed the Protestant Episcopal Church, the most dramatic of the adjustments. Uh, but every, every faith community that had a European origin has to make confessional and catechetical adjustments. Uh, it's just part of the new world. And it's an interesting story in early diaspora religion. Um, when you create new religious communities in colonies, and those colonies go their own way, what happens? And many African countries, whether Francophone or Anglophone, go through that negotiation of the 20th century. Um, the Asian frontier, especially the Indian subcontinent, has to go through that same frontier negotiation. And in some sense, that's good, right? I mean, there are core aspects of faith, but as Calvin and Knox and others, uh, Father Joshua, uh, Doc, Reverend Joshua can tell you, um, as, as there are core and there are fora, there are dogma and then there the is non-essentials. And the idea is that you can have dogma, you can have a confessional church, you can have a set of basic prescriptions, you can have a set of creeds, but you can adjust to the local community. Not on the essentials, not bending the faith, but adjusting. Think about it as plants. You know, plants grow to the light. Uh, and sometimes the light is differently directed in different communities around the world. And it's okay to have right-wing and left-wing themes, Presbyterianism or other forms of faith. I think that's healthy rather than pernicious. Okay. Regarding state coercion, what do you say about compulsory education, which is now founded on the worldview or religion of cultural Marxism? Y you might even compress that a little bit. If you think of Justice Jackson's comments in West Virginia B. Barnett, that the state cannot prescribe what is politically orthodox. It's not allowed to coerce political orthodoxy. I mean, why don't you tackle that one? Yeah. Cultural Marxism is pretty loaded. Um, I'm not sure the established schools, uh, the public schools around the, around the country uh, should all be characterized that way. But it, there's no question about the problem of de-theologizing the public school classroom and public school experience from the 1940s to the 1990s. The Supreme Court systematically, from 1948 to 1985, outlawed, per the First Amendment Establishment Clause, Religious teachers, religious texts, religious symbols, religious prayers, religious moments of silence, even religious teachings of origin. And simply said, those are not allowed in the public school classroom. Uh, and if students want to have religion, they should get it at home, do it at recess, do it after school, do it in the summer, but not in the school. And the worry is, is that what's then left? If you've basically extracted religion from the curriculum and from the student's experience, from their understanding as de budding democratic citizens what it is to interact with the world, I mean, what have you left? And Dr. Carper has written a wonderful handbook kind of working out the problems of that. Um, and the reality is, is that we still have a circumstance where our public schools are largely de-theologized in the curriculum and in the official school events. We still blanch at the idea that we would have a prayer, even as private prayer by a high, public high school coach in the most Kennedy versus Bremerton school district case, uh, we still worry culturally with all of those separation of church and state instincts that when a coach at the end of a football game bows down and, and takes a little knee, uh, that, that suddenly is a violation of the establishment clause when people are carrying on and cussing and swearing and doing all kinds of things and drinking on their tailgates out in the parking lot and all that's fine. And as part of that is just the the residue, in my view, of the kind of de-theologized public school experience that the Supreme Court engineered. And I'm blaming it on the Supreme Court because they're the ones that pushed this agenda. I think what's happened in the last 20 years in this new wave of more robust religious freedom, the court has turned down uh, that philosophy. The Kennedy v. Bremerton School District case uh, 
help for the coach. He was allowed to pray. Of course, he has free speech right, just like everybody else does. Um, increasingly, these challenges that are testing whether a religious symbol that sits along 20 others in a public school classroom has to come down because it's so offensive to the students, increasingly those cases are getting tossed. And so we're beginning to back off from the most zealous forms and abstemious forms of separation of church and state, but it still leaves a kind of vacuum in the public school curriculum that is worrisome. Dr. Carper has been a nation's leader in trying to figure out well, how to how to allow religion to be a part of the student's experience uh, and finding where the gaps are in the jurisprudence that will allow us to at least include within the student's experience some measure of acquaintance with religious things, with religious symbols, with religious texts. The court early on said, look, um, it's okay if you're going to teach a course on origins to have Genesis 1 and 2. You can have other myths too, but Genesis 1 and 2, but not in the science classroom. Or at least you could have it in the course of origins. If you teach a course in American history, you can talk about it to the Puritans who come over to the Mayflower, not just some Joes from England. You can talk about their religious identity. You can talk about the city on the hill mentality. Uh, when you're teaching art history, you can have Botticelli's with Madonna and the babe uh, as part of the student's experience. Um, you're teaching literature, you can include the Psalms in the literature class, and so there are places where religion can properly be part of the experience of the student, um, but there's still a kind of stigma attached to religious identity and practice that is a little bit worrisome. They're trying to balance coercing students who may not have those same faith convictions and forcing these young, impressionable kids to participate in something. You know, the non-coercion principle is very strong, especially for the innocent little impressionable folk, and at the same time trying to figure out a curriculum that works. In my view, I think Dr. Carper's view is the same, um, religion is not something like alcohol to be postponed until you're 18. Maybe zipped on a little bit at home when you're younger, but something to be postponed. Um, and that's how it's being treated in public schools. And the worry is, is that, well, maybe religion needs to be, in all of its warts and all, needs to be part of the student's experience from the start. Inevitably pluralistic, like the founding fathers would have it. Inevitably reflective of the demo religious demography of the community that is represented in that school. Inevitably sensitive to all the different kind of nuances that are out there. It can't be catechesis, but it certainly can be education of religion. And in my view, that would be healthier for a democratic citizen that than to be brought up on the idea that religion is something private, religion is something scary, religion is those funny people do over there, it's a superstition that's going to die. If that's what you mean by cultural Marxism, that still is a worry. And the further problem is, um, the opt-out is what? private schools. And what do private schools do? Well, they charge tuition. And what does that foreclose? Half the population being able to afford it. And so now this public versus private has become very much an economic issue. It's become a race issue. And we've tried to mitigate that by some of these measures like you saw in Carson B. Macon with his you know, voucher programs. But it's kind of makeshift, trying to mitigate the reality that um, parents have to pay property taxes to support a public school that they probably can't abide, and at the same time have to pay private school tuition uh, to send their juniors to a religious school that they find consistent with their faith. Um, and that's deeply worrisome because it's hard on the parents. Anybody making under 100K a year has got three kids is in trouble in our culture today. Um, and it's deeply, deeply unfair to many portions of the population. So people have been talking uh, pretty amply over the years, but more vociferously now, about maybe we should just think about education as education. And as we do in some countries in Europe, and historically we've done in Canada, uh, just recognize that education is something that the parents choose for their kids. They can't choose to keep their children ignorant, but parents should be allowed to choose where their kids get educated. 
And if they want to send them to public school, great. If they want to send them to private school, great. If they want to send them to private religious school, great. And it's the same for everyone. And that kind of idea that education is a public good, and that public good can be discharged by the state-run school, by a private secular school and a private religious school alike, that philosophy of kind of robust school choice is alive and well in the literature. Um, it's beginning to poke into some of the policies around vouchers and the like, um, but it's a hard sell. Uh, it's very deeply entrenched understandings of public schooling uh, in this country, and the leaders of our society were brought up on the very separation of church and state, secular, secular laws, don't you know? Uh, and for them, it's mother's milk. Uh, and uh, now you're, depri you're depriving us of our American way. And two generations or three generations of people brought up in that kind of education, it's very hard to turn them around um, and reimagine them. Um, the more public schools fail, the more kids get left behind, the poorer we do on all the international test scoring, the more people will say, hmm, I think they'll do something. And we're already beginning to experiment. COVID, for all its tragedy, taught us there's a lot of different ways to do education. Homeschooling is an interesting option. It's not, not an option for a lot of people, but homeschooling is an interesting option. Charter schools are interesting options. There's various ways of fixing this stuff. Most of them so far are band-aids, some of them big band-aids. Um, over time, they might give rise to a whole new experiment, but it's going to take a generation for that. So someone makes an observation on what perhaps might be the, the average age of the attendees. Mm. It's fairly kind, but, um, but accurate. They ask, uh, what are your thoughts on the next generation standing in the gap for religious freedom? How do we better engage with them to do so? What are you seeing at Emory that gives you hope? Um, I think there's an interesting thirst among young students for uh, doing something new and second guessing some of the things that went on in their parents and grandparents' generation with respect to education, especially education around religious freedom. Um, what I'm seeing is religious freedom classes that I teach, I get 100 students who show up in an, open, in an elective. Um, and they come and they sit and they debate and they have all kinds of views and, and it's a very kind of robust part of the curriculum for them. I see 55 long religion centers that have popped up around the world uh, doing religious freedom and other things, and each of them uh, highly successful uh, in as educational uh, endeavors. Uh, and successful because students are taking them, foundations are supporting them, uh, and they're keep producing uh, the next generation of leadership in the field. We have a law and religion mostly religious freedom section of the Association of American Law Schools, which is our union uh, for law professors. And there's probably about 900 members now. Generation ago, there are probably 300 members, and most of the new people are students uh, that are now grown up and are young faculty members. So there's an encouraging, there's an encouraging new trend afoot uh, of people recognizing this. And we have very skillful trainers out there, the Alliance for Defense of Religious Freedom, the Beckett Fund, um, the Anti-Defamation League, the ACLU, when it does religious freedom stuff, um, they have some really robust educational programs that have been highly, highly successful in tapping the best law students, giving them summer experiences, letting them have internships, um, letting them um, get a two-year, three-year residency in a, in a law firm that's doing high-level litigation. So I'm encouraged, frankly. Um, I said somebody at dinner, forgive me for repeating it to you. Um, our generation, we grew up with a divorce culture. Right? It was just, you know, 50% of marriages fell asunder. And kids grew up, you know, having to negotiate that. And one of the interesting consequences of that is that the children of divorce are doing much better now in their marriages. They're taking longer to get married, they're being very careful about whom they pick, they're being deliberate about their uh, life path, and when they're educated, 90% of those marriages are sticking. And there's 
sticky, not because we taught them the right way, they, they, they're sticky because they experienced something different, uh, and they didn't want to have that for their kids. And I'm not pointing any fingers, I'm pointing them on myself too, uh, but it's interesting to watch the young generation kind of adapting uh, to a world and then trying to make it better by their own behavior. And I dare say, in a day when religious freedom was being deprecated and viewed as second class and dismissed oftentimes as just the idle desires of the superstitious who were trying to carve out a law unto themselves, I think increasingly people who have heard that for a while have come back and said, I'm not so sure. And kids that have come out of public school education and now kind of gotten into real life have begun to realize, geez, I'm not so sure this is the best education I want my kids to have. Maybe we should be engaged in reform. And I, anecdotal, but I'm going to encourage, frankly, uh, at Emory and even law schools more generally, uh, in the liberal West at least, uh, how robust the engagement with law and religion question and especially the religious freedom question has become. Um, the big literature out there and a bunch of very smart kids that have been there. Since broadcasting slash telecasting is under the FCC and licensed by the federal government, what do you think the future might be for religious broadcasting, especially if the broadcasting might include a message at variance with public policy, for example, sexual orientation and identity and sexual relationships? Ooh, I don't know. That was a short answer. I don't know what the FCC regs are. I don't know to what extent there is um, a non-FCC regulated world on the internet that uh, does its broadcasting independent of um, the usual channels that television and radio used to have under the jurisdiction of the FCC. So I just don't know the answer to that. I don't mean to be ducking, I just don't know. Um, I do think um, that nowadays there are so many, so many platforms on which to stand to make your message heard that um, I would be surprised if there's not some way uh, of YouTubing and all the other different ways by which the most unpopular messages um, by the censors of the current culture um, might want to have the most unpopular and popular messages can be broadcast. But my short answer is I just don't know and I have no, no great insight to the question. John, I know at your center you have represented Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars, Christian scholars, correct? Yes. At the center. Is Islam compatible with the American constitutional experiment? Is Islam compatible with the American constitutional experiment? I know that's broad because yeah. there are varieties um, of Islam. It's a... Um a loaded question, a difficult one. There are two billion plus Muslims around the world, and is Islam is a, a which kind is, I think, the interesting thing. Um, one of the interesting things is that uh, when we think of Islam, we think of Saudi Arabia, and we think of the Wahhabi school, and we think about the very, very particular kind of Muslim identity that is available there, and that form of Muslim identity is not compatible with the American constitutional experiment. Um, but there are more, many, many, many more Muslims in Indonesia than there are in the Middle East, uh, and let alone all the other places of the world where Islam uh, has flourished uh, in the diaspora. And I think one of the burdens that every immigrant community has uh, when it comes to a place like the United States is that it has to abide by the basic cultural prerequisites of citizenship. And it's not just passing a test at the INS and then going on your merry way. I think if you want to play by, if you want to be part of the American story, you've got to be played by the American rules. And there are basic rules in place with respect to uh, democratic governance, to rule of law, and to constitutional liberty uh, that are non-negotiable. And there are Muslims, I know a number of them, uh, that have been able to find ways and resources within the Islamic tradition 
including in the Quran and the Hadith, uh, that match well and can accommodate, if not celebrate, um, the American values that we have built into our constitutional experience. One of my colleagues, Abdullahi An-Naim, um, has made a career and put his life on the line uh, to make an argument uh, for an Islamic theory of human rights, an Islamic theory of religious freedom that is very much um, compatible with and indeed chastening in its demands to the American experiment in religious freedom for all. Um, he's got an unpopular message uh, in the Islamic world. He has put his life on the line when he articulates this in different Islamic majority contexts around the world which have less sympathy with that kind of view. But the reality is, is that he represented his views and millions of Muslims in the United States represent in their experience, lived experience um, a way of shaping, adapting to the zeitgeist around them. Remember that tree and bending to the light? Well, there is a consistent light that Muslims have to bend to. And if they want accommodations and liberties under the American experiment, they're going to have to live by its light. Both enjoy its fruits, but also and follow its path. Doesn't mean they have to change what they do in their faith community. Doesn't mean that they have to now have their Quran in English. Doesn't mean that they have to give up their head scars. Doesn't mean that they have to uh, sacrifice fundamental things that are part of their religious identity. Um, we can accommodate. This is flip side. If they're accommodating the experiment, it's our accommodating them. Religious communities are different it's diversity that we celebrate, not penalize. So there's a way, there's a way by which Muslims can adjust, and there's enough flexibility and enough diversity in the worldwide Muslim community that that can be um, a ongoing cultural navigation on both sides. Um, doesn't help. It doesn't help uh, when we have belligerence on either side. It doesn't help when people brandish uh, anti-Sharia measures uh, and produce these hackneyed versions of Jewish, of Muslim law and say, see, we can't have that in our culture, oftentimes out of profound ignorance about what they're actually prohibiting. It doesn't help when Muslim apologists uh, engage in um, let's slay America uh, and sometimes use that kind of shocking rhetoric as a way of provoking uh, reaction. It doesn't help to have Danish cartoon crisis and Charlie Hebdo crisis and simply say that somebody else's free speech now has violated our religious freedom and requires violence. That's not the American way. And if that is the insistence on folks uh, that want to be under the American constitutional experiment, if that continues to be their insistence, then they have to go. Or they have to go to prison. Violence is violence. Uh, we are already hearing, and we'll hear more loudly in the future, that this, uh, this election is the most important election of all time, and that if we don't vote a particular way, it is the end for uh, the American experiment, democracy, the Christian faith, and so on. So my question for you as a student of law and history, how much is at stake in any particular election? Um, there's always a lot of stake in every election. Uh, it's been like that from the very beginning. Uh, the John Adams versus Thomas Jefferson election in 1800 was viewed as the apocalyptic end of the world. Uh, and you think the rhetoric in our elections is heated. Back then, my goodness, nothing, nothing even close to what we have here. Jefferson is the Antichrist, the whore of Babylon, who is going to drag us all into uh, a Jacobin jungle. And Adams is the Puritan Pope with his smug, black, robed Puritan insisting on a one way and one way only. That was just the start to the rhetoric back then. And what was the whole world was at stake. Um, elections are pinch moments in cultures. They're pinch moments in polities. But they are by no means make or break. They are no means of the same apocalyptic, apocalyptic uh, flavor as the rhetoric would indicate. 
We have a stable constitutional democracy here for all of its creaking, for all of its groaning, uh, for all of the excesses. Uh, we have the luxury in this country of having big political and constitutional and cultural fights without precipitating civil war. And it is amazing to think historically uh, the kind of fights that we're having today in the public television that we're having today um, public debates and parading and whatnot. Uh, in the old days, that would precipitate a civil war. We would be fighting with swords and with cannon fire. In Serbo Croatia, they're still fighting about some jackass in 1370 uh, that desecrated somebody's grave. And now they're still fighting. The blood feud just goes on forever. We have the luxury in this country of fighting our most difficult battles by peaceable means. And elections are just one of many, many places where those battles get worked out. Uh, and the constitutional democracy that we have still stands firm. I think the founders got it right in creating the constitution they did and giving it the adjustments that it has to making the amendments to make it better. It's by no means perfect. It's not a heavenly form of virtual government. Uh, but the election system is one piece of what they created back then. And it's working fairly well. We've had crisis moments. We've had Bush v. Gore. We've had Trump v. Biden. We've had people that have engaged in uh, name calling. Um, we've had contestants before. Um, it survives. And the next election, is going to be another contest. It's going to yield a great deal of rhetoric. It may even breed a little violence given our increasing volatility these days. Um, but it's going to be decent. It is by no means, by no means, um, a crisis for the future of America or the future of religious freedom. Um, people of goodwill ultimately are making these elections. Um, and I think I have faith in part because I have faith that things will work out. <laughs> I'm going to piggyback on the, on the last question before we go downstairs yeah, and people can face off with you. you know, no, it, the it, you know, <laughs> John, John was born in Canada, so face off has particular meaning <laughs> in, in, for Canadians. It's, it's called hockey. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a, a variation on a, on a question here, which is what is the best way for a person to stand for religious freedom in today's culture. Um, let me add a little bit to that. Uh, there are persons that suggest that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. I think David Barton is a good example of that school of thought. There are others on the other end of the spectrum that talk about the secular constitution and that religion was very unimportant. Um, given those polar opposites, where should a person be right now in defending religious freedom? Number one, by doing unto others, as you would have done unto you. Uh, religious freedom is not something that's constitutional. Religion is a gift. Religious freedom is a gift to human nature. And it is the best way that we can express our love to our neighbor is by respecting and fighting for their religious freedom. I think that's first. Secondly, I think it's important to realize that there are critical cases that need to be litigated, but there are also many conflicts that need to be negotiated. And making the distinction between the things that, be, that are litigated and are marched into court and things that are resolved by non-court means uh, is one thing that people of faith can really show. There is an admonition in our New Testament about go tell it to the church. There is an admonition about trying to make sure that uh, you one by one, go to your brother or sister uh, and ask for forgiveness. And I think to the extent that we can lower the temperature on religious li freedom litigation uh, and to do that through negotiation, through arbitration, through various ways of dispute resolution, independent of courts, especially when it's fellow brothers and sisters that are at issue, I think would help a lot. Uh, I think third, um, the fruits of religious freedom need to be enjoyed. Um, and people need to see the fruit of religious freedom. And one of the things that the church does better than any is preach the word, administer the sacrament, care for the poor and needy, catechize the young, uh, and serve their neighbors. And religious freedom is not simply 
a freedom. The religious freedom is a freedom to do the duties of the faith. And the duties of the faith and the duties of the church are about those fundamentals. Preaching, administering the sacraments, caring for the poor and needy, catechizing the young. Do that in a powerful, consistent, loving, uh, and generous way. Uh, and the fruits of religious freedom, the value of religious freedom, the essential dimensions of religious freedom, I think, would be exemplified. Fourth, I'd say um, there are times when you can't negotiate, when you can't exemplify, when you can't arbitrate, and you have to litigate cases. And litigating cases is a big business. Um, there are a lot of public interest mills out there that do this work. Some of them are doing it very, very well. Some of them are doing it in a generous way for all people of faith. Um, but there's nothing better than to see the ACLU fighting for a Christian ministry, to be able to be a chaplain in the military, or for the Alliance for Defense of Freedom, right-wing Christian organization, fighting for um, a Muslim to be able to have a Friday worship service in his prison. Um, it's wonderful when religious freedom organizations um, offer religious freedom protection and services across the board, rather than to become special interest groups uh, for a particular religious denomination. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having a Presbyterian arm of religious freedom fighting. Nothing wrong with having a group that's particularly tight down. Some groups don't have the luxury and don't have the funding to be able to be pervasive in their services, but boy, that sends a good message uh, when folk of different faiths seek out the protection of folk of different faiths. Um, one way that we as individuals can contribute is supporting religious freedom organizations. Um, there are a lot of good ones out there. Um, the Americans United for Separation of Church and State started as a Presbyterian outfit. Um, the Alliance for Defense of Freedom is a Christian organization, very serious. They're very serious at student formation in the Blackstone program. They do a lot of cases before the Supreme Court and federal courts. Um, they tend to be a mainline evangelical type, um, but they represent people across the board. The Beckett Fund is another group, Catholic Voice uh, in D.C., very serious litigators, uh, very smart, involving um, a lot of really high-level um, advocates from around the country. The Christian Legal Society is a, another important group that's been actively involved in this. The Muslim Legal Society, the Jewish Legal Society, the Anti-Defamation League. You can go through, and there's a hundred organizations that I can send my students to to get good training and that are doing good work in the religious freedom uh, space. Um, interestingly, um, they measure their success not on wins before the Supreme Courts or the federal courts. They often measure their success by how many cases they can negotiate and negotiate and settle. And that's important. And it takes a real act of humility on the part of those organizations to settle cases rather than get victory and the headline uh, and the microphones in their face. So I think I go back to the start. The best way to protect religious liberty is to live it. The best way to see religious liberty, religious liberty is the freedom to do the duties of the faith. Love God, love neighbor, love self. I think you can understand why John was, uh, has been selected 12 times as the outstanding professor of law at Emory. Uh, he's not only good with the pen, he's, he's good on the podium as well. So we are going to adjourn downstairs. You can sit and talk with John face to face if the question didn't get answered up here. If you still have one of these white cards and are not on our email list, fill it out and drop it in the donation box back there. Uh, so we can include you for our series event next March, which we're still working on at this point. Uh, if you feel persuaded to uh, donate to the support of this series, you can drop a, a Jackson or a Grant or a, a Lincoln. <laughs> how about a, yeah, how about a Grant? Uh, in the donation box. 
If you want to give by check, you can make it out to Cornerstone Church and put ECS on the subject line, and uh, we would welcome any support that you could give to this series. Um, so, John, Eliza, Rock, you may adjourn to the, uh, to the uh, fellowship hall, which is accessed by going out either the front door or this door, turning left down the hallway. You can either take the elevator or the staircase, and we will see you downstairs. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. I do.